In this video, we're going to be going through the second latest addition to Mythic Plus, Dawn of the Infinite, Marazon's Rise. By watching this video, you're going to learn each mob's mechanics, how all the bosses work, and that's going to allow you to know exactly how to react when you come up against them yourself. And if you're watching this guide, we're guessing you're the type of player that's always wanting to play their best. But these days, it's kind of hard to find the type of information that actually makes you improve and hit your own goals. Now, sure, everyone can follow a simple damage guide, but what makes some players actually stand out? Well, we've been working with players from Echo and Method to answer that question. Over the past few months, they've been helping us design exclusive guides from Mythic Plus, available only at our website, skillcap.com. These guides include class courses which teach you min-maxing tips for damage, healing, utility, and defensives. The complete package of everything you actually need to learn in bite-sized, easy-to-understand videos that teach mechanics you can implement right now into your own gameplay. And we're so confident that you're gonna rank up that we even offer a rating gain guarantee while actively using our website. To learn more, visit the links below. But for now, let's get back to the video. So, without further ado, let's get straight into it. As you begin your run, you're going to immediately be charged by two Tears Vanguard mobs. These mobs cast Rending Cleave, a frontal attack with a stackable bleeding debuff. Make sure you're positioned behind these mobs to avoid this mechanic, and taking them out will be a breeze. Next up, we're going to encounter our second mob type in the dungeon, the Infinite Twilight Magus. Significantly more dangerous than the Tears Vanguard, this ad is going to cast a massive AoE damaging ability called Corroding Volley. This is a high priority cast, so make sure you kick or stun it as it can cleave your entire party. The Twilight Magus will also cast Epoch Bolt, which deals high single target damage. Try to interrupt this when you can, but not at the cost of letting a Corroding Volley go through. After dealing with these mobs, you're going to consistently encounter them throughout the first segment of the dungeon, accompanied by the next three mini-bosses, each of which has its own set of unique mechanics. First, we have the easiest mini-boss, Valo Timesworn Keeper. This mob casts Temporal Strike, which creates swirlies on the ground that you have to dodge. Failing to do so is going to result in you taking significant damage and being thrown into the air. The Keeper will also cast an ability called Titanic Bulwark, which creates a shield for all targets standing inside of its dome. Now, this doesn't apply only to mobs, but also to players. Because of this bulwark, it's crucial for tanks to move adds out of the dome, but tank them close to it so that the rest of the party can benefit from its damage reduction. Second, we have Lorai, Times Worn Maiden, whose main mechanic is the Orb of Contemplation. This orb works as a boomerang, stunning and dealing massive damage to anything in its path, and then coming back and doing the same on its return to its origin point. To deal with this, make sure you're aware of its pathing, and if a player does get hit, make sure to dispel them out or they're going to get killed when the orb returns. The Maiden also casts Ancient Radiance, which can't be kicked or stunned, so if you're low, this is a good time to use a minor defensive. Finally, we have the Spurlock Timesworn Sentinel, probably the most dangerous mob in the first segment of the dungeon. Every 20 seconds, the Spurlock will target the party's ranged player in charge, which on higher keys will one-shot literally anything in its path. Now because of this, you're going to need to be pre-moving toward your ranged player to avoid the damage, maintain uptime as a melee, and prepare yourself for its next mechanic. Following the charge, it'll create a sand-like AoE effect at its destination point, and then begin channeling Binding Grasp on a random player. This ability deals huge ticking damage and makes the affected player unable to press any buttons at all. This ability must be kicked quickly, but you can only do so if you're inside the sandstorm with the mob. To deal with this mob, make sure to assign kicks to the highest mobility player in the group who has a kick with a cooldown that's shorter than 20 seconds. Now, after dealing with these mobs, you're going to have a 20-second roleplay event while the Keeper gets ready to rumble, so don't try to precast your offensives like Shayla does here. Once Tyr, the Infinite Keeper, has finished talking, it's time to get into the fight. The first mechanic is Spark of Tyr, which places an AoE effect on two players, dealing heavy damage over time until it explodes, hitting everyone in the group. 
To deal with this, make sure to dispel one target and spot heal the other with the debuff until it naturally times out. You can also use mass dispel on both, but do be cautious, especially on higher keys, as this can wipe your group if they're not ready to use defensives. Following this mechanic, Tyr's gonna alternate between casting Infinite Annihilation, Titanic Blow, and Dividing Strike. Each of these abilities is gonna cost the boss 25 energy, entering phase two when he reaches zero resources. But first, let's cover what these abilities do. Infinite Annihilation is gonna target a random player and initiate a rapid frontal cast, which you absolutely have to dodge. It's gonna also leave behind a substantial yellow AoE ground effect that you wanna avoid as it inflicts high ticking damage inside of it. Due to this pool, try to drop it away from the center for an easier phase two. Next, we have Titanic Blow, which targets the tank, dealing massive damage and knocking the tank and players around them backward. Make sure you have a defensive ability that's ready for this and avoid playing on the edge of the platform to prevent getting knocked to your death or pushed into the pool created by Infinite Annihilation. The final ability of Phase 1 is Dividing Strike, which requires a minimum of two players to soak it. Failing to do so will cause the boss to enrage for the entire remaining fight. The soaking point for Dividing Strike is located on the boss, so ensure that if you're a ranged player, you're fairly close to melee to make soaking easier. Once the boss reaches zero energy, he's going to transition into phase two, start channeling onto the middle pillar, and gain a massive absorb shield that you must destroy to progress in the fight. Throughout this phase, temporal essence orbs are going to spawn around the room, granting you 10% haste up to a maximum of 50% for each soak. If you don't soak this mechanic, not only will you lack a significant amount of haste, but the boss is going to also gain more absorb on its shield, delaying the phase significantly. To make this phase easier, try to position the boss close to the center, as it's going to make it easier to catch the orbs while maximizing your DPS. Once you break the shield, the boss will cycle back around with Sparks of Tear and the other three abilities, Infinite Annihilation, Titanic Blow, and Dividing Strike until it's defeated. Now it's time to face two more adds before taking on the Gauntlet. These are the Infinite Watchkeeper and the Timeline Marauder. The Infinite Watchkeeper is going to be creating swirlies from Timeless Curse that you have to dodge, as this is going to deal damage over time and stun players inside. It'll also cast Infinite Fury, which is a huge AoE pulse, so make sure your party isn't too low on health as everyone is going to be cleaved down. Meanwhile, the Timeline Marauder is going to be casting Displaced Chrono Sequence, which must be kicked as it's going to create an Absorb Shield and deal significant splash damage, as well as channeling Infinite Schism, which deals AoE damage and creates pools that you must avoid. This ability cannot be stopped, so make sure you're dodging and using all your defensives here. Once you've defeated these two mobs, it's time for the Gauntlet, which we struggled with quite a bit at first. The goal of this Gauntlet is to reach the end without touching any of the mobs or getting hit by their cast. Now, to do this, we found the best way is to zigzag to fake out the cast that come from the mobs as they aim towards where your character is moving to, not where your character is. Alternatively, you can hug one of the walls and try to sprint through as fast as you can before any of the casts go off. Fortunately, once one person makes it through the gauntlet, a portal opens for the rest of the party, allowing them to be teleported and skip the gauntlet altogether. Now that you've made it through the gauntlet, or been summoned, it's time to face two more mini-bosses that we must defeat to enter the next room. These mobs are the Infinite Saboteur and the Infinite Diversionist. The Saboteur will cast Bronze Exhalation, a massive frontal attack that targets the tank, as well as Timeless Curse, the pool stun mechanic we dealt with in the previous pack. Meanwhile, the Diversionist is going to unleash Infinite Fury, a mechanic we've also seen before. When facing this pack, just make sure to dodge everything on the floor and don't stand on top of your tank, making the frontal attack become trivial. Next up is the Twisted Timeways Room full of dangerous sand that you must clear a path through to be able to get to the portals on the other side. Now, to clear this room, you're going to have to kill mobs with a time displacement buff while they're standing in the sand, which is going to remove the sand forever on that spot. Just make sure you don't stand on the sand as a player, though, 
but you're gonna be taking some pretty heavy damage. So, with that out of the way, let's cover the mobs that are littering this room. First up, we have the most dangerous mob, the Time Stream Anomaly. With its Bloom ability, this spell is first applied to the tank and is then duplicated onto another random player. Any damage the tank takes is then also dealt to the linked player. To deal with this mechanic, make sure to dispel it as soon as possible and have your tank use active damage mitigations. The Anomaly also has the frontal untwist, so make sure you're ready to dodge, and if you're the tank, try to aim the mob towards the sand. The second most intimidating mob here is the Infinite Rift Mage, who casts Infinite Burn, putting a large damage over time effect and snare on the target. Also, be wary of them casting Temporal Blast, which is a big single target damage spell. This mob should have all the priority kicks as its abilities can easily chunk your party down. When the Rift Mage dies, it'll also drop a beam that connects itself to every other dead Rift Mage in the Time Lost Battlefield. This can be used for fast travel if it's needed. We then have the Temporal Fusion, a classic tank buster ad with its triple strike ability, which strikes three times. Make sure you have your damage mitigation ready and don't over pull this mob. And finally, we have the Temporal Deviation, another tank buster, and this time with Double Strike. Once again, just try not to over pull too many of these at one time. When clearing a path, you can choose which portal to go through. Here, we start off with the second to last portal on the right, which leads us to the Morchi boss first. After taking this portal, you're gonna have a short roleplay ride on this big, timeless custodian before arriving at some new mobs that we haven't encountered yet. The mob you should watch out for the most here is the Time Lost Wave Shaper, a murloc who casts Fishbolt Volley, which deals cleave damage on the group. Just make sure you're kicking this. And then he also casts Bubbly Barrage, which spawns swirlies on the ground that you have to dodge. This cast is not interruptible, However, you can and should crowd control and knock it. The second mob that should be on your radar is the Infinite Timebender, who casts Dizzying Sands, a five second AOE disorient that you must kick, and also Millennium Aid and Millennium Defense that shield and heal enemies, which you want to try and crowd control. Then comes the Time Lost Tidehunter, who does huge tank damage with the bleed effect Slobbering Bite. This ability can be crowd controlled though, or you can simply dispel the bleed with something like an evoker's cauterizing flame. Finally, we have the Time Lost Wake Thrasher, who is a basic mob without any abilities other than trying to left click you to death. Don't worry about this guy. Now that the trash is taken care of, it's time to take out Morchi. When you pull Morchi, she'll cast Sandblast, a frontal that targets the tank, so just make sure you're not stacking too closely. Following this, she's going to cast more problems, which is going to spawn Morchi clones. This mechanic is very similar to the Mist of Tyrna Scythe boss, as you're going to have to find the real Morchi, which is the one with the bright blue hair and without any sort of hat. It's very important you identify the real Morchi and stand behind her, as all the images cast Dragon's Breath, which is going to deal huge damage and apply a ticking dot afterward. Standing behind her is the only way to dodge it without using an immunity. After this, she's gonna cast Time Traps. This is very important for the next mechanic, Familiar Faces, which creates a copy of each player. These copies will fixate on their player, and your job is to run your ad into the Time Trap to make them explode. However, when doing this, make sure that you are not trapping them all at the same time, as this explosion deals significant cleave damage to the whole party, and if it's not controlled, it's gonna cause you to wipe. Once this is complete, Morchi's just gonna cycle through her more problems mechanic, so make sure you're ready to run into the middle and identify which one is the real Morchi, and then she's gonna be casting the Sandblast Frontal again. And finally, she'll cast Time Traps again, but however, this time your fixated clone is gonna spawn from the trap it was in previously, so remember where you left them the last time. Once Morchi has been defeated, we return to the Timeways room and go through our next portal, which is the second from the left, or at 10 o'clock. Alternatively, you can choose to go straight forward from Morchi and encounter a mob pack consisting of the Infinite Timebender, as previously covered with its dizzying sand AoE blind ability that we have to kick, 
The Time Lost Rocketeer, which serves as a tank buster with its staticky punch ability and rocket bolt volley that you must interrupt due to its cleave damage. And the Time Lost Aerobot, featuring a frontal attack with Electro Juiced Giga Blast that you should try to dodge. Additionally, it has a bombing run mechanic where it charges a player and sends out explosives on the ground. Just avoid stacking on this or you're going to risk getting hit by cleave. Taking this direction is going to lead you to the crossroads, where you can choose which portals to take rather than returning to the central hub. However, in this route, we are once again going for the second from the left portal, which is going to allow us to reach the time lost battlefield boss and face a different mob pack. The first mob we're going to cover here is the Kronaxi. This ad will cast Temporal Link, which is going to tether to a player, causing all damage dealt to the Kronaxi to be reflected back to the linked target. To deal with this, make sure you spot heal the linked target and don't burn the mob too fast, or you're going to end up one-shotting your teammate. The Kronaxi will also cast Chrono Eruption, a highly damaging swirly that's on the ground, so make sure you dodge this at all costs. In this pack, we also have the Pendule, which casts the cleave ability Time Beam, which can simply be kicked to prevent any of the damage from going off. Anyway, back to the Time Lost Battlefield boss. Once these mobs have been dealt with, the boss room will open with the first mini boss being the Alliance or Horde Destroyer. To begin with, the mob's gonna cast Volatile Mortar, which you have to dodge or you're gonna take massive fire damage. In addition, it's gonna cast Deploy Bombers, which will create ads that run toward a player and try to explode. To deal with this, try to kite them as best you can or crowd control them with roots, knockbacks, or any other long range AOE CC. If you do get hit by them, try to get hit one by one to avoid stacking up their explosions damage over time effect, which does more damage than the explosion itself. If you get hit by more than one, you can use a defensive here. After this ad is defeated, three more ads will spawn. Two Alliance Knights who cast Rallying Shout, which you have to interrupt as it's going to buff all the ad's damage and health. They also cast Sundering Slam, which will create a swirly below the tank that must be dodged as it deals physical damage and a stacking armor reduction. The third mob, the Paladin of the Silver Hand, will cast Consecration on individual targets which you have to dodge. These casts will spawn where the player was at the beginning of the cast, so make sure that you're not stacking with your party and move as soon as it begins casting. The Paladin is also going to cast Holy Light, which is going to heal the lowest health mob, so make sure you have a kick ready for this one as well. Once these mobs are defeated, either Anduin Lothar or Gromash Hellscream will spawn, and all that's going to depend on your faction. These bosses share the same mechanics, but they have different spell names. Now, as you begin the fight, the boss will first cast Mortal Strike on the tank, which is going to apply a 75% healing received reduction for 5 seconds. Make sure the tank has damage reduction for this mechanic, or they're going to quickly fall. Following this, he's going to immediately cast several shockwaves on random players. These shockwaves are going to deal significant frontal damage, so make sure you dodge quickly. It's also important to try to aim the shockwaves away from the yellow phased mobs as if these are hit by the shockwave, the boss is going to empower with its battle senses ability, causing AoE damage to the group. After shockwaving three times, the boss will summon adds, one melee, one caster, and one archer. To deal with this, you should tank the boss on the archer, which will dead zone their abilities while dispelling their bleed effects if possible. While doing this, make sure to kick the caster on both Fireball and Blizzard to pull them into the pack which will allow you to cleave everything down with the boss. Next, the boss will Bladestorm, which you want to try and kite around the edges of the platform to avoid killing the ghosts due to the battle senses buff that we mentioned earlier, and then the fight repeats until the boss is defeated. Once again, we're going to return to the middle of the dungeon and choose the central portal, which will take us to the connecting bridge just before the final boss. While crossing this bridge, avoid going into a brain AFK mode here, as the ground can be lethal with its pulsating area of effect damage orbs. Keep in mind that each of these portal routes is optional, as faster methods may be developed as more people practice the dungeon. After crossing the bridge and entering the final portal, you're going to find yourself in a frosty looking area where the last boss, Chrono Lord Deus, resides. But first, we have to handle the last trash pack which includes mobs that we've encountered before. Two Timeline Marauders. 
To deal with this mob, ensure that you interrupt displaced chrono sequence to prevent AoE damage and the absorb shield, and avoid the swirlies while using defensives on the infinite schism cast. As for the infinite slayer, make sure you're dodging the bronze exhilaration frontal and your defensives are still running for its infinite fury ability. And with that out of the way, it's now time for the final boss, Chrono Lord Deus, who's all about positioning and ad swapping. When you first engage Deus, you're gonna immediately see two orbs spawning with a soak underneath them. This is the main mechanic of the fight, so pay attention closely here. These balls are called infinity orbs, and when they land in their pool, will cause huge damage as well as a stacking party-wide debuff, increasing damage taken from the next orb by 75% for the next four seconds. However, when you soak a pool, you're gonna slow the infinity orbs descent, causing it to explode slower and allowing you to avoid having it explode while the damage increase debuff is active. This means that every time you see this mechanic, Make sure you have one player soaking an orb so they both don't land at the same time and one-shot your group. These orbs will always spawn on two players at the same time, preferring the ranged party members. However, will go on a random melee player if there's not two ranged in the group. Due to the predictability in the orbs targeting, it's a good idea to decide who's going to soak and move out of orbs before the fight to avoid any mid-pull confusion. Following this, he's going to cast Summon Infinite Keeper, which will spawn adds you have to kill immediately. These adds cast Chrono Burn, a potent damage over time effect that you have to dispel. They also cast Infinite Blast, which you should definitely aim to interrupt. If left unchecked for too long, they're going to call in reinforcements, so do these two things. Every time an Infinite Keeper dies, it damages Deos for 20% of its health over 4 seconds. Now, while this is happening, Deus will also be casting Temporal Breath, which is a frontal attack with a significant damage over time component. If you're the tank, make sure to face this away from the group. These mechanics will repeat until you reach Phase 2 when Deus is at 55% health. At this point, he's going to fly into the air and call additional infinite keepers that you must chase down and deal with. Once these mobs have been dealt with, Deos will begin to cast Infinite Corruption, which will create dangerous puddles on the ground, and you have to dodge these at all costs, as they'll also leave a lingering space denial effect that deals heavy damage. Throughout this last phase, Deos will continue to create Infinity Orbs and cast Temporal Breaths. This entire fight becomes a race as you have to kill him before you run out of space due to the infinite corruption puddles while also soaking the orbs to prevent a wipe. It can become very chaotic, but fortunately Nosdormu gives us a haste buff, so it's advisable to save your bloodlust and time your offensive cooldowns to come up in this phase to quickly pull through. And just like that, you've defeated Dawn of the Infinite's Murazan's Rise. Now, before we wrap up, be sure to check out skillcap.com to preview the courses that we now have available. Over the next few months, we're going to be growing our website, and we expect to have most specs ready by the holidays. We're the only service that offers a risk-free guarantee, promising that you can gain at least 500 IO score while using our site. To learn more, visit the links below. And as always, though, we want to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you soon.